Good morning, church. Um, it's such a joy for me to be with you again, and I trust that you're keeping well in the season. Uh, everything is going crazy, and I read the stats and see how it's kind of just going exponential. So, yeah, I just encourage you to keep social distancing and keep wearing your masks as well. Well, we're continuing on in our series uh, from the book of Ezra, which is just so timely that God has um, brought it to us, this book, at, at a time such as this, and in our Coming Back Stronger series. And so today we're going to look at Ezra chapter 3. And I want you just to imagine uh, these 50,000 exiles making their way home. I mean, for those that were uh, somewhere between the ages of 50 and 70 years old, uh, I mean, they hadn't been back uh, in like decades. And then probably for the vast majority of them, particularly the younger uh, guys, they'd never even seen Jerusalem. They'd only heard the stories about it. And so I just imagine all the emotion as they finally got back in their old neighborhoods and, and maybe they connected with some old people that were left there. I don't know where they lived at first. Maybe they knocked on some of the doors and said, hey, I'm your long lost cousin who used to live here uh, over 50 years ago. You know, can we come and stay somewhere? Um, I'm not sure uh, exactly where they lived at first, but Ezra chapter three is all about a fresh start. It's about this fresh start of repentance and revival and restoration of worship. I don't know about you, but I love a good makeover story. And I remember back to when my girls were in primary school. Uh, at the end of every year, there was the annual prize giving, the award ceremony, uh, and probably the oldest teacher on staff would stand up uh, at the end of the prize giving and announce the special award called the Ex Terpi Novo Award. Now, I happened to do Latin at school, so I knew what that meant. Ex means out of, terpi means moral disgrace or something that's really ugly and foul. And then novo means to make new or to revive. So this was a special award. It was also a bit of an awkward award. And so this teacher would get up and she would say, this year the ex Terpi Novo Award goes to a grade seven boy. And then she just began to list all this boy's sins about how he always got into trouble. He was always in the principal's office. He was a bully. Uh, he'd be down in the corner of the school field, uh, you know, being a, a dacha dealer. Who knows what all he got up to? And um, yeah, and then suddenly, uh, even though it was really awkward and you were thinking, yo, this poor guy, he's having his sins paraded before all the parents in the hall, she would say, but then there was this transformation. He turned over a new leaf and became such a wonderful boy, helpful and generous, and we're so grateful for what's happened in his life. And uh, even though it was kind of a little bit awkward, as this boy would come onto the stage or whoever it was in every particular year, his face would just be beaming. And as he was beaming, I just realized, hey, this boy probably would never have made it to an award ceremony uh, if it wasn't for this uh, particular award. But maybe you feel like you need uh, an ex Terpi Nova award. Maybe you wish you could get a fresh start in some way. Maybe uh, a do-over. Perhaps there was uh, a decision you made in life and it, it took you on the wrong path. Perhaps there was a conversation you had, and as you replay that, maybe with a family member or somebody else, it's led to some kind of alienation. Maybe there was an outburst. Maybe you've just taken some kind of wrong tour, uh, wrong kind of detour in life, and you've ended up where you didn't want to be. Maybe some of you just wish we could end 2020 with all that we're going through. Maybe you agree with that meme that's been doing the rounds on social media that says, let's just put up the Christmas tree and call it a year. And maybe that's how you feel. Uh, let's just be done with 2020. And when you look back to New Year's Eve uh, at the start of this year and you think about the dreams and the goals and the plans that you had, that just feels like a lifetime ago. So maybe you wish you could change your habits or your hair or your looks. Or maybe, you know, you just wish that that you could have got different marks and got in for a different course or change your weight. Maybe you've messed up in some way. Perhaps as a parent, you just say, sure, I've messed up things so badly with my kids. I'm not sure I can ever turn back time. Uh, things have just gone on this way too long. Maybe as a spouse, you just are not happy with the way things are going in the relationship and you recognize that, yeah, you know, if you had done things differently, maybe things wouldn't be in the place that they are today. Perhaps people have labeled you and put you in a box and you just feel, I, I can't get out of this box. My spouse thinks this of me. My friends think of this of me. My family thinks this of me, my friends. And, and but I want to say this morning that God is in the business of do-overs, of starting afresh in the gospel, 
That doesn't mean that God just magically wipes out the consequences for our sins. That doesn't mean it's not a, a difficult path to restoration with people. But God can repay us for the years that the locusts have eaten. And so maybe you wish you could start over. And that's what Ezra chapter 3 is all about. It's going to show us that a fresh start with God always prioritizes three things. These three things. So number one, a fresh start with God always prioritizes atonement. Atonement, and that might be a word that uh, you know. It might also be a word that you're not familiar with, and I'll explain it in, in a moment. So let's begin by reading in Ezra chapter 3 from verses 1 to 3. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, the people assembled together as one in Jerusalem. Then Joshua, son of Josadak, and his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and his associates, began to build the altar of the God of Israel to sacrifice burnt offerings on it, in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Despite their fear of the people around them, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening sacrifices. So we'll read the rest of the text as we make our way through. So what stands out to me in this account is that the first thing that the people of God did, the first priority was to rebuild the altar of God. And as I read that, I was thinking, why didn't they start by rebuilding the walls? I mean, that's what the book of Nehemiah is about. You know, that would have made a political statement. We know what walls can do in terms of politics. Uh, it would have also given them protection and security. And then they could have relaxed and really focused on, you know, building the altar and the temple and other things. But they started by building the altar. They didn't even start by rebuilding the temple. And I think it's because they knew this deep spiritual significance of the altar. This altar, which was a raised platform with a flat surface, was the place upon which they offered sacrifices. This was the place where their sin was dealt with. So their first priority was to rebuild the, alt the altar because their greatest priority was atonement for their sins. They were alienated from God. They weren't in right relationship with God. And atonement, we might say at one mint or even reconciliation, means that God has provided a way for us to come back and to be in a harmonious relationship with him. And that happens through the shedding of blood, because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so they could only come back to God if their sins were paid and atoned for. And they recognized that before they did anything else, this was their burning desire to be in right relationship with God. And so if you're watching this morning, I want to say to you, if you want a fresh start, it starts by being in right relationship with God. I know there's other baggage in your life and, and maybe people you need to repair that damage with, but it starts by recognizing that all sin is first and foremost an offense against God and we need to be in right relationship with Him. Now, I want you to think for a moment. When they were in exile in Babylon for all those years, there was no altar, there were no sacrifices, there was no temple. That means for uh, around 70 years, there was no way for their sin to be atoned for. And like the prodigal son, they had tasted the bitterness of where their sin could take them. It had taken them into captivity, into exile. And like the prodigal son, they were lying there, wallowing in their sin and, and, and suddenly realizing what had been missing. But here they are on their way back home to the Father and the Father in His grace is waiting. He has provided a way for them to come home and He is just so ready to run to them and to receive them back. That's what atonement is about. Now, Derek Thomas, he's a Bible commentator, says they were reminding themselves by building this altar that the problem lay within themselves and the solution to their problem lay outside of themselves. And I think you and I often get that confused. We think the problem lies outside of ourselves and we blame people and we blame our circumstances. You know, that's what's causing me to sin. It's the traffic. But I think it's Paul Tripp who says, no, those things just squeeze the sponge of our heart and what comes out of a man's mouth, that's what's, what's truly in him. So we can't always blame our circumstances. 
And then sometimes we think the solution to our problems is within us. I, I can just turn over a new leaf, set another you know, New Year's resolution. But Derek Thomas says that the building of the altar showed us that the problem was within them and the solution to their problem was outside of them in the provision of atonement. Thomas says an atonement that could never come, of course, from these bulls and these lambs and could ultimately only come through the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it's only by the shedding of his blood that forgiveness will come. And that's what the book of Hebrews is about. It's showing us that the Lord Jesus Christ is the one that the shadow of this whole sacrificial system was pointing to. He's the one that was the fulfillment. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 11 says that day after day, Every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, talking about Christ, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And a priest would only sit down if the work was complete. That's why Jesus said, it is finished. The work of atonement was complete on the cross. And all this blood in the Old Testament, so much blood, it, it could never atone for those sins. It was only a pointer, it was only a shadow of the reality that pointed to the light of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that captivity has a way of exposing what is missing in your life. And I think it was only as those exiles went into Babylon did they recognize that actually they'd had a half-hearted worship of God. And now that uh, he was missing from their life, they were not in relationship with him, did they long for the temple. They longed for God's presence. They longed for worship. And I think this season of lockdown perhaps can do something similar. It shakes us up. It shows us what's really important. What are your priorities? Where do you run in times like these? I don't know about you, but the season has exposed some sin in my life, just attitudes and, and, and maybe, yeah, just frustrations and things that have come out that wouldn't have been exposed in, in, in a normal season. So I want to encourage you in the gospel, like the exiles, come to the altar. Like the prodigal son, come home again. The father is waiting. Come to the cross, to the altar of the cross where Jesus gave his life. He sacrificed his life on your behalf so that you could come into this harmonious relationship with the Father. Start over again by simply repenting and believing. Repentance and belief is not something you did years ago, a one-off. It's an ongoing daily thing. Lord, may I repent afresh today. May I believe again. May I trust you. May I continue to obey. Return to your first love. That's where you must start again. Now, I want to show you this cross diagram. It's something I've shared with you before, and it's been so helpful in my Christian life. But if you think of this timeline of your life, if you know the Lord today, well, there's a point at which you come to know Christ. That's the point of conversion. And then there's a growing awareness. On the one side, there's this growing awareness of God's holiness that God is far more holy than I, I ever thought at first. He's, he's so perfect. He, he cannot just turn a blind eye to sin. He can't just forgive sin. Somebody has to pay for that sin because he's, he's holy. He's just. And then on the other side, the longer I'm a Christian, the more I become aware of my sinfulness. You know, the closer we move to the light, the more we recognize, hey, we need fresh cleansing. And so the longer I'm a Christian, I, I, I just find myself saying, Lord, you are so beautiful, so perfect and so holy. And Lord, I don't measure up. But then in the middle, we have the cross, this cross that bridges the gap between man and God. And so as our awareness of both of these things grows, so our love for Christ and for the cross and his death and his atoning work becomes more sweet, more special. I realize I need the cross more today than I did when I first became a Christian. That's my awareness. But I think you and I shrink the cross. We try and pull God's holiness down and we say, ah, you know, God's not really that holy. You know, my sin's not that big a deal. And so we, we try and shrink God down. We try and say, hey, I, I can measure up easily. And we shrink the cross. So think of all the ways that you and I maybe seek to atone for our sin instead of accepting what Christ has done on the cross. Maybe it's self-esteem. You know, I'm not that bad. You know, if I just think positively, if I just believe in myself, if I just try harder. But those are just forms of denial. That's just pretending that I don't really have a sin problem. Or what about blaming others? 
so easy for us to maybe blame our genes, to blame science. Science has discovered these genes and that's why, you know, there's this or we blame the DNA that we got from our parents. or We blame our spouse or we blame our circumstances. That's just really a way to excuse our behavior. Or we might even say, you know, I, I messed up again, but that's not really me. That outburst, that's not me. But then who is it? Of course it's us and we need to face that reality. And in facing that reality, it's actually liberating because we recognize that's why Jesus died. We need the cross. Or maybe we try and distract ourselves with a passionate cause. You know, if I throw my life into the church or into some charity or, or organization, you know, if I'm just doing good and helping people, that can hopefully atone for my sins. Or maybe as parents, we try and instill perfection in our kids. You know, it's like I've messed up, but boy, I'm not going to let my kids mess up. And we over control our children. and We just say they better toe the line and they better live the life that I didn't live. But really, is that going to atone for your sin? Is that a good way of parenting or self-righteousness? Thinking that if I do enough good, that can outweigh my bad. Surely that'll impress God. Or what about the opposite? Self-loathing. I remember this young drag addict in my first church, just never wanting to come to the gospel. Always just saying, oh, I'm too bad. You know, people look at me funny. God can never forgive me for the stuff that I've done and the drugs that I'm doing, you know. And he kept wanting to kind of put himself on the cross. You know, I deserve hell. I should just go to hell. That's, and he wouldn't come to the gospel. That self-loathing is also failing to recognize that there's this bridge and you, by God's grace, can start over. And if that's you, maybe you're in Jerusalem, but you're still living as though you're back in Babylon where there's no way for your sins to be atoned. But you can come today because in the gospel, the altar of Christ is available wherever you find yourself, even in your homes, wherever you're watching this morning. So how are you going to deal with your guilt and shame? There's only one way, and that's at the altar of the Lord Jesus Christ and seeking him just like it was for those first exiles. Seeking God has to be your number one priority. So a fresh start with God prioritizes atonement. And number two, it prioritizes obedience obedience. So I want to read from verses four to six as we continue on in this chapter. Then in accordance with what is written, they celebrated the festival of tabernacles with the required number of burnt offerings prescribed for each day. After that, they presented the regular burnt offerings, the new moon sacrifices and the sacrifices for all the appointed sacred festivals of the Lord, as well as those brought as freewill offerings to the Lord. On the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, though the foundation of the Lord's temple had not yet been laid. So there's so much here that I could have said about these festivals and there's some amazing significance here and some beauty in what's happening. But I just want to kind of step back from this chapter because we've agreed to look at a chapter per week. And what I want you to notice from the section we just read is just this renewed desire to obey God this renewed desire to do everything by the book. So look back at verse two. We read, they built the altar in accordance with what is written in the law of Moses. Verse four, then in accordance with what is written, they celebrated the festival of tabernacles. Verse five, they wanted to follow all the appointed sacred festivals of the Lord. And verse 10, they took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David. So I want you to see this renewed desire to do everything by the book, diligence. And what did Jesus say in John chapter 14 and verse 15? He said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. You see, this is about love. If you've been reconciled to God, the next thing to flow out of your life is a changed life. Obedience comes from being reconciled to God. You don't first obey and hope that that's somehow going to bridge that gap. No, you trust Christ's cross. And then from that, you, you leave the courtroom, so to speak, having been declared innocent because Jesus has been sent to prison on your behalf, so to speak. He's paid the price. If you just go out of that courtroom and you live in exactly the same way, you haven't grasped grace. Grace has to transform you. It has to teach you to say no to ungodliness. How can the people of God here in Ezra chapter three ever claim to have been reconciled to God? If they go back and they live in the same way as they lived before they went into exile and think about it. Why was it that they went into exile in the first place? 
What led them there? It was cutting corners in their obedience of God. It's because they didn't do everything by the book in accordance with what is written. And they ended up doing whatever they felt was right in their eyes. And so I believe that when revival comes to God's people, it always first revives us in our relationship with God. And then it brings a renewed obedience, a return to God's word, that God's word is our priority on which we build our lives. So can I ask you, are you a person of the book? Are you diligent in your obedience? Are you sure that particularly what you're thinking and the way that you're living is in accordance with God's word? especially in areas where you and I might be prone to do what's right in our eyes. It's like that's off limits. God mustn't speak to me in that area. Sometimes we even know what's required of us and we turn a blind eye. We ignore it. We, we know, as I, even as I say that, there are areas of the Christian life where we just say that's off limits. I, I don't want God to go there. Are you sure that your desires are biblical, that your lifestyle is biblical, that your theology is seeking to be biblical? Think about areas of sexual immorality. You know, sex before marriage or just this, the common practice of so many couples who just say, hey, let's live together before marriage. Is there a diligence to say we want to go back? God's reviving our hearts. What does his word really say on these things or drunkenness or self-control? What about greed? This desire to just want more stuff, the selfishness, the ongoing selfishness I still see in my lives. And sometimes I'm so deeply challenged when I see the generosity of others. And I think, Justin, why is there still some areas of selfishness? It's because I need to come again and repent and believe and obey. What about social media? We're open and we just see the division on racial lines and racism and people not listening to each other and other points of views, even though God's word says we're all created in his image. And yet, actually, deep down in our hearts, there is still prejudice. What about husbands loving your wives as Christ loved the church? What a calling is that? And wives responding to that love with respect. And what about children honoring parents? We could go on. God's word is the best for us. But are we diligent? Do we really say, Lord, if I've got a new life, I want to honor you. I want to please you. Or are you always the one who's looking for exception clauses. You know, this doesn't apply to me. My circumstances are different. That's what led these people into exile because they were worshiping God just with their lips, but their hearts were far from him. They thought if I just check the boxes, I can even manipulate God. But God sees through that, brothers and sisters. He knows if you're just obeying because you're trying to impress people to look good. He knows if your obedience is not from the heart. A fresh start involves coming back to God and obeying him from a heart that loves to please him. But before we move off this point, I want to highlight something else from our text, and that is that obeying God is sometimes really tough. If you want to truly obey God, there's going to be opposition, not only from the world, not only from Satan, but from your own flesh. Everything is going to fight against that obedience because the more you obey, the more you will look like Christ. And Satan doesn't want Christians to look like Christ. What did verse 3 say that we read? Despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it. Despite their fear, there's always going to be opposition if you want to obey God. Don't for a moment think that it's going to be easy to obey God. Love for God obeys despite the fear. That's what courage does. Courage is not the absence of fear. It's pushing through the fear. The fear is still there, but says, I'm going to obey God anyway. Any God-sized step of obedience, any step of faith might even cause a crisis of faith. There's going to be fear in your own heart. You're going to be trembling. But I want to encourage you, fight fear with fear. The people of God realized that fearing God was of greater importance than fearing their enemies. In fact, it was when they were strong that they still went into exile. It was when they were strong in themselves and they weren't fearing God that God was able to get them to exile. So they knew the primary thing was we need God's protection. We need his provision before we even build the walls. They realized in the words of the Apostle Paul that if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for you, please tell me who can be against you? I think these exiles realized the truth of Psalm 127 in verse 1, that unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. 
And unless the Lord watches over the city, the gods stand watch in vain. True revival always brings a renewed and courageous obedience for God. It brings about change and it causes a stir in the world around us. So may God bring us back stronger. So a fresh start with God prioritizes what? Number one, atonement. Number two, obedience. And thirdly and finally, it prioritizes worship. Worship. Let's read verses seven to nine of Ezra chapter three. Then they gave money to the masons and carpenters and gave food and drink and olive oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre so that they would bring cedar logs by sea from Lebanon to Joppa as authorized by Cyrus, king of Persia. In the second month of the second year after their arrival at the house of God in Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josedach, and the rest of the people, the priests and the Levites and all who had returned from the captivity to Jerusalem began the work. They appointed Levites, 20 years old and older, to supervise the building of the house of the Lord. Joshua and his sons and brothers and Cadmiel and his sons, descendants of Hodaviah, and the sons of Henadad. Henadad's an interesting word. Maybe he was married to Henamom. I have no idea. The sons of Henadad and their sons and brothers, all Levites, joined together in supervising those working on the house of God. So Ezra chapter, chapter three tells us that after they'd finished the altar, they ordered building materials that they took about six months to come. And then after that, they began to rebuild the temple. And we see that they made some sacrificial investments. Even the end of chapter two tells us the gold that they gave and just it, it, it was dismal compared to what the people had given to Solomon's temple. But they gave according to their ability. And that's all God asks us to give to him in our worship and service according to our ability. They believed that the public worship of God required their best investment of time, their best investment of resources and money and their best people. And we see that whole list of people, all sorts of people there. And so the question I have is, how do you worship God? How seriously do you take it? Think of how well you prepare for other things, maybe preparing for an exam or a presentation or some sporting tournament or a job interview or a significant purchase. You wrestle, you think, you prepare, you make sure you've got your ducks in a row. And, and what of when we come to public worship? Even now, even though we're not gathered publicly, how do you prepare to come to a Sunday service? Do you read the chapter ahead of time? Do you, are you reading the daily devotions that we prepared for you, that Shelley has prepared? They are excellent. Uh, a reading per day, Monday to Friday, on the passage that's about to come. That's the diligence that's required. And why should we pour all of our energy into other things and God gets our leftovers? And so my challenge to you is to think, do you invest as much energy in your prayer life as you do at the gym? Do you exercise your mind uh, with the same diligence as you come to study and wrestle with God's word as you do when you're wrestling through an equation in the classroom? Do you fantasize about the blessings of obedience to even the same degree as you fantasize about lust and about what would your life look like if you had X amount of money as you fantasize about revenge against somebody? Do, do you take that energy? that the sinful nature wants to use on other things. And do you take that and redeem it for God and his worship? Look at verses 10 to 11. Our text tells us that when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord. He is good. His love toward Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. What a celebration of worship. I wish I could have been there to experience that. The foundation was, was finished. It was complete. And I think sometimes the hardest part of a project is just getting started. Not in every case, but sometimes a project like this, just the glory of even getting started was a miracle. It was God's provision. It was a, a picture of repentance. It was a picture of revival. It was a picture of new beginnings. It was a, a picture of a promise of what was to come. 
And think about this. They praised God even before the full and final answer had materialized. There was no temple there. All there was was a foundation, but they were praising God even with the promise of what was still to come. And they shouted with joy and they sang exuberantly. And I think this kind of worship is worship that honors God. Worship ought to produce an intensity of emotion within us. Worship should move us. And your greatest intensity of emotion shouldn't be reserved for a Hollywood blockbuster movie. Your greatest intensity of emotion shouldn't be reserved for when your uh, favorite sports team wins a game. I believe our best intensity of emotion should be used for God in the worship of God, that we would be moved to, to grief when we sin, moved to confession, moved to praise and adoration. Does the beauty and the majesty and the love of God not move you? Does God's glory, does being used by him in his service to build his kingdom, does that not move you? Is there any greater thing than to be used by God to build a foundation into someone's life? The revival of God's people always results in a renewed intensity of worship. And you can look at church history and it, it bears that out. Because in worship, God gets the glory. We don't get the glory. They weren't praising themselves because they'd given and they'd done all these things. They gave God the glory. And does God get the glory for what you and I build? Because it was God who had raised up Cyrus. They were in exile. They couldn't free themselves. As the scripture said, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. It's God who makes you alive. God raised up Cyrus. Cyrus issued a decree to set the people free. Cyrus was the one that gave them resources and letters of authorization. God was the one that stirred their hearts. We saw in chapter two last week with Richard when he unpacked that God stirred in their heart to return. This was God's glory. But I want you to see as well from our text that there were mixed emotions on this day. Mixed emotions. Look at verse 12. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. See, the younger generation that was there that day were looking forward. God was doing a new thing. They were saying, this is a fresh start. We're so excited to be about God's business. And they looked forward and they shouted with joy. But there were many in the older generation who were looking back and they wept. Those who were 50 years and older could remember the former temple. Maybe they even said, I stood on this exact spot all those decades ago. You guys have no idea what that was like. I saw the temple on fire. I saw the flames licking the, the wooden beams and, and, and licking the, the huge stones. Those were the glory days of Israel. Uh, you don't understand. The glory has departed from Israel. It's impossible for this new temple. Guys, all we've got is a foundation. It looks dismal compared to that temple. The, the gold that we've given doesn't compare to the gold that Solomon was given in his day. This temple will never compare to the glory of Solomon's temple. And I think there was a danger in their weeping. A very grave danger which G. Campbell Morgan highlights. Campbell Morgan writes, the backward look which discounts present activity is always a peril. Regrets over the past which paralyze the work in the present are always wrong. Such regrets are in danger of blinding the eyes to the true value and significance of the present. And so there's a subtle danger for us who are older to reminisce, to be nostalgic about the glory days, maybe even what we perceive as the glory days of Rosebank Union Church. And we've had a wonderful legacy, haven't we? There's been the Lee Robinson era and the Ellis Andre era and Terry Ray and going back even further in this 115 year history. But such kind of nostalgia can also reveal a terrible ingratitude for what God is doing in the present and what he wants to do when we eventually go back under the ministry of Richard van Lissot. And God spoke through the prophet Zechariah in chapter 4 and verse 10, and he says in reference to this build, rebuilding, do not despise the day of small beginnings. Don't despise it. You might think this is small and ordinary, but don't despise it because I'm at work. I'm here. And I mean thinking, maybe there won't ever be a new normal. 
We talk about this new normal. Maybe it's just going to be new and nothing's going to be normal because normal seems to point back to the past as though there's going to be a new, but it's normal, kind of like what it was in the past. And maybe the past is gone. I don't know what the future will bring. But what I do know is that God will still be there. God will be in our future doing something new and longing back to past seasons of glory while we give thanks for them can be crippling because God wants us to work and to build today in our day. And God calls each of us to experience him right now, right here in the midst of COVID-19. Stop waiting for the past to return. Stop waiting for the future to arrive. We need to be able to find God here and now because God is doing something new before our very eyes. Isn't that what God spoke through the prophet Isaiah? Chapter 43, verses 18. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? God asks these people, do you not perceive what I'm doing? Dare we be in, ungrateful for what he's doing? And he says, I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Friends, I believe it's this nostalgic attitude that eventually discouraged the younger people from building altogether. We're going to see as we read further that the building of the temple stopped for a good few years because the people were so discouraged. And some of that discouragement was because they, they just didn't think that it could measure up to Solomon's temple. And they began to then build their own homes and take some of the wood that had even come for the temple and invested it in, in their own homes. And that's what the book of Haggai is about. God challenging his people to say, how can you be building your own homes when my home lies in ruins? So God knows that his people are crippled by this comparing. And this is what God asks them through the prophet Haggai. And it's such an encouragement to you and I today. And I read it from Haggai chapter two. God says to his people, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? So God agrees with them, but he wants to change their perspective. He says, but now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, the high priest. Be strong, all you peoples of the land, declares the Lord. And work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. God's saying, this is a pattern. I took you out of exile once before from Egypt. I was with you and my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace because it's from this house that the Lord Jesus Christ will come. He will walk in this temple. Ex Turpi Novo. God is in the business of bringing something beautiful and something new out of moral disgrace and failure, even from exile, even from COVID-19. Do you believe that? And Ezra chapter three closes with these words in verse 13. The final word from chapter three. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. May the sound of God's fresh new work reverberate through his people, through you and I, so that even those who are far away from God would be drawn near to come and see that God's name is not in ruins, that God has not left his people alone. Let us join our voices with the exiles of old as we shout and sing, God is good and his love endures forever. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this amazing chapter three. Lord, you are good and your love endures forever and your love is new every morning and you are at work through every generation, through every season. Lord, even in seasons of exile, you're at work reminding us what is missing, that we might come back to you, that we might have a renewed desire that as the deer pants for streams of water, we might pant for you. We might say, when can I go and meet with the living God? My tears have been my food day and night. Oh, Lord, I, I pray that you would enable us to perceive what you're doing, even just small glimpses in this season. Lord, we are confused. Lord, we're battered. Lord, we're fearful. 
Lord, we're doubting. I pray, Lord, that you would come and as you have done, that these amazing promises that we read about here, that you would come and give us a fresh start, that we would just come in repentance and faith, that we'd find atonement at the foot of the cross, that, Lord, we'd be moved to be revived in our obedience of you, that we'd do business with you in this season, and that, Lord, we'd come and worship you, that our lives would be a testament, that we would move out and the noise from, from our praise would transform lives, Lord, that the justice would flow from your throne through us to the nations, because we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.